Paperback Writer is one of the catchiest songs that the Beatles ever released. And it marks a pivotal moment for the band in many ways. It also has a few intriguing anomalies that you might have missed. I'm going to examine those anomalies in the context of the song's unique recording history. As a fair warning, once I point them out, you can't unhear this. In early 1966, the Beatles were in the midst of a major transition in their career. They were shifting away from a relentless schedule of touring, recording multiple albums per year, and acting in films. And they were moving toward a more deliberate approach to songwriting and in-studio production. Their latest album, Rubber Soul, released in December 1965, signaled that the band had turned a corner creatively as well, integrating the fresh sounds of folk music and Indian instruments and expanding their lyrical themes beyond romantic love and relationships. By late March 1966, pressure to start recording new material was mounting, and so the band convened at EMI Studios for a series of sessions that would eventually become the basis for their landmark album, Revolver. Per their usual pattern at the time, though, the first order of business was to record a new single. Deliberately venturing into new thematic territory, Paul had stumbled upon an idea for writing a song about, well, writing. Working in collaboration with John, Paul developed a somewhat tongue-in-cheek story of a man trying desperately to sell his work of fiction to a publisher. Musically speaking, Paperback Writer was the offspring of their earlier single, Day Tripper another catchy, riff-centric pop hit released a few months earlier. But this time around, the band made highly creative use of innovative studio techniques to shape the song, a shift in their approach to production that would dominate the Revolver sessions and last until their breakup. On April 13, 1966, the band gathered at EMI Studios for a six-and-a-half-hour evening session to rehearse and then record Paul's brand new song. By the end of the session, the band had accomplished a suitable rhythm track, labeled Take Two. At this stage, we can hear Ringo on drums, and though there's some dispute over the rest of this lineup, it most likely was Paul playing that iconic riff on electric guitar, John on rhythm guitar, and George Harrison on tambourine. Interestingly, the main riff is strikingly similar to one first used a few days earlier for another Paul song, Got to Get You Into My Life, in which would end up on the Revolver album. With the rhythm track complete, the band moved on to vocal overdubs, including Paul's double-tracked lead vocal. Dear sir, oh madam, will you read my book? It took me years to write, will you take a look? And some wonderful harmonies. Paperback on the next day, April 14th, the four Beatles returned to the studio to finish off the song. One of the key missing parts was the bass guitar, since Paul, typically on bass, had instead been handling the lead guitar during the previous session. But the band had a new idea in mind. They were impressed by the beefy bass sound on songs from American labels such as Stax and Motown. To help achieve a similar sound, they enlisted the help of Jeff Emmerich, a young and eager EMI engineer who would accompany the Beatles throughout their evolution into a more studio-focused group. Using a highly unorthodox technique at the time, Jeff rewired a loudspeaker to act as a microphone thereby picking up a wider range of low frequencies. Paul, using a new Rickenbacker bass guitar, overdubbed his new part onto the existing backing track. The end result was a more potent bass part than had ever been heard before on a Beatles song. And Paul deployed this new sound extensively throughout the Revolver album. According to studio logs, the band also experimented with a few other quirky overdubs, such as piano and organ both ultimately abandoned, so we unfortunately don't know what those sounded like. One late addition that did make it through, however, was a rendition of the classic Forever Jacques nursery rhyme. It's a thousand pages, give or take a few. I'll be writing more in a week or two. By 7.30 p.m., the band had wrapped up their work on Paperback Writer and would move on to recording the flip side of the new single, Rain, another song not about romantic love that would also employ extensive studio ingenuity to signal to the world that the Beatles, and pop music generally, had turned a significant corner. Although the band had finished recording Paperback Writer, there was a bit more creative work applied to the track in post-production. 
During the mixing process, Jeff Emmerich applied a new technique for creating snippets of echo and delay using multiple tape machines at once. You can hear it most clearly at the end of this verse. While today this effect would be effortlessly achieved with a digital software plugin, at the time this required a significant amount of coordination during the live mixing of the song. An interesting consequence of this being added live during the original mix was that when the 2022 remix was created, this delay effect had to be created again from scratch. There's a couple of other fun little anomalies and mistakes buried in the track, too. At around 57 seconds, you can hear a cough caught by one of the live microphones during the backing track. <clears throat> then, at 1 minute 20 seconds, someone comes in a little bit late on the Furujaka harmony. You really like it, you can have the right. It can make a million for you all the night. Toward the end of the song, you can hear someone warming up to practice their harmony part a second or two before it starts. I love these charming little organic anomalies of the analog era that probably wouldn't be left in a modern digital recording. There are other little surprises that continue to emerge even decades later. In May 2023, on a thread on the Steve Hoffman forums, a fan claimed that they had detected a previously undocumented sound of a typewriter. Could it be that the Beatles, who were not strangers to using random objects or sound effects, had included an actual typewriter somewhere in the mix, it certainly would fit with the theme of the song. Realistically, though, if the band had used something as unconventional as an actual typewriter, it probably would have been mentioned at some point then or in the years since. Most likely, it's either the hi-hat on Ringo's drum set or the tambourine played in an offbeat rhythm that perhaps was intentionally made to sound like the narrator typing away at their novel. Regardless of what it actually is, this is yet another example of an anomaly that, whether intentional or not, fits remarkably well in the final result. Released as a single in the U.S. at the end of May 1966, the paperback writer Rain Combination was a bold preview of the magic that was coming on the Landmark Revolver album, released three months later in August. Paperback Writer quickly hit number one on the U.S. charts, the 12th of their singles to do so in barely two years. Interestingly, at the time, reviews were mixed. Some people were startled by the change in sound and style and felt that the Beatles had lost their way. In a way, the critics were right. The Beatles were evolving, or revolving, and their new single was a clear signal that the Beatlemania era had given way to a new phase of confident experimentation. They weren't alone in this transition. In fact, the Beatles have admitted that parts of Paperback Writer, specifically the gorgeous harmonies, were inspired partly by the Beach Boys, who at the time were considered to be their American creative rivals. Paperback Writer's impact on pop culture at the time was significant. It even served as the direct inspiration for Last Train to Clarksville, the debut single written for TV sound-alike band, The Monkees. The song also marked a turning point for the Beatles as live musicians. Given how much was overdubbed and manipulated in the studio, this was the first single that simply didn't translate that well to a live performance. But they did try. In fact, Paperback Writer would be the only song from the Revolver era that would make it onto the 1966 tour. A more fitting representation of the song's milieu is found in director Michael Lindsay Hogg's music video, a rather artsy, mimed performance that doesn't have Ringo anywhere near a drum set. In the decades since its release, Paperback Writer has earned acclaim as being among the finest examples of their pop songwriting. And it's almost unbelievable how much is packed into just two minutes and change. All of their talents are on full display here, from the unconventional, witty lyrics to the effervescent performance of all four bandmates. Combined with the superb and cutting-edge production at EMI, it sounds just as fresh and exciting over a half-century later. 
What do you think about Paperback Writer and its many anomalies and innovations? Let me know in the comments. And as always, thanks for listening and subscribing. Bye-bye.